and I am I'm very happy to be here with you this morning and uh, very impressed that you're here at this time of year when things are starting to get super crazy in the schools. I appreciate you wanting to participate in this session. So today we are going to look at the challenges that you may still be facing um, as you go forward with this process. Uh, here are my disclosures. Uh, so today we're really going to identify and discuss the four most common barriers to addressing swallowing and feeding. We're going to problem solve with general suggestions and solutions to these uh, barriers or challenges. And then I hope that we can get a little personal and have a discussion about the, the challenges you're having in your school district. What are the things you've tried? Uh, what's worked? What, can you, what could you do next? I think that there's a real possibility for us to problem solve and come up with some good solutions. Um, so let's begin by talking about challenges and barriers. To me, a challenge, challenges are the things that keep you from being able to address swelling and feeding in the way that you want to do it. So you may be able to do something, but it's really, you're not feeling like it's enough, like it's, it's the way it needs to be. So think to yourself, what are your challenges as we go through this? Write them down, either in the chat room or just on a notebook for yourself so that you can put it on paper and really start thinking about what to do about it. And then what are the barriers? Barriers are the things that actually prevent you from addressing it. So, you know, those could be uh, things that keep you from even beginning to address it. And we're going to talk about that. Do you have barriers in your situation and what exactly are they? Um, so the landscape of where you live and work, it's generally no accident when things happen. It's a function of the landscape that we, our, our school districts create. So there's this setting that we are in, in the schools. And uh, what you're doing by attending these sessions uh, throughout the year and talking about this issue is just taking a step back to take the time to see how you might shape that landscape and how it can align, those changes can align with the current situation, which determines the results you're gonna get. So we're taking a meta uh, look at our landscape and to go ahead and to try to make some changes and to shape it. So what does the law of entropy tell us? And does it have anything to do, that is a scientific term, does it have anything, or a mathematical term, does it have anything to do with uh, our situation in the schools? Entropy is one of the consequences of the second law of thermodynamics. The most popular concept related to entropy is the idea of disorder. Entropy, entropy is the measure of disorder. The higher the disorder, the higher the entropy. This means that, um, so things left to their own devices without any structure or order will become more disordered. So a good example of that is in your garden, when you stop pulling the weeds and you stop pulling out the vines, what happens? they begin to multiply and take over. The same thing if, if you have an iron pipe and it has a rust spot, if you leave it and you don't do anything, it continues to grow and move. And so that those are examples of entropy. We can agree that our systems, our jobs seem to expand and have more moving parts all the time, okay? They seem to be moving at a faster pace than they used to. And they may move even faster next school year. The potential to become paralyzed by the potential for disorder is what we're talking about here. So my goal has been to preserve rather than erode your engagement, okay? To vouchsafe the process, the procedures and interventions which must take place in the context of feeling safe and confident regarding working with your students with swallowing and feeding disorders. Why does entropy matter in this particular situation? Because we've already said it increases over time. It is a natural tendency of things to lose order. So left to their own devices, life will become less structured. As society and the world and our schools become more robustly vibrant, we look to assure order and safety in those areas that call for it. So we take order in our gardens by edging and mowing and weeding and taking care of it, okay? We patch that pipe and that controls the disorder. As our school caseloads and responsibilities increase, the importance of procedure and being proactive becomes more essential to really 
control the disorder. Our school cafeterias are a really good example. They are wonderfully active, noisy, busy places for children to eat. But they also can be a very difficult setting for children with swallowing and feeding disorders. In fact, a place where we may look to assure not only order, but safety. So when talking about challenges and barriers, First of all, acknowledge that chaos that is the natural order of things and that is part of your job. How can you control that chaos and alter the landscape to result in a more efficient and controlled setting for children with swallowing and feeding disorders? What exactly can you do? So let's begin with talking about a problem solving process. Um, I was first um, made aware of this problem solving process uh, many, many years ago. Uh, we used it in our department. Uh, it, and I learned the process. It's, it's based on Debbie's uh, problem solving process. And we used it to come up with new forms, to come up with some uh, new ways of scheduling and things like that. And I was really very impressed by how this structured approach generated so many ideas and solutions. Uh, so you're going to begin by forming a committee of professionals in the district or who you work with who have knowledge and an interest in swallowing and feeding. Uh, it is a six step process. The first step is to define the problem in terms of needs. So look at the causes of the problem, not just the problem, but what, what are the causes of the problem? For example, the school district is not addressing swallowing and feeding. So maybe the cause of that is that the school district has never uh, had a student choke at school or parents request a, a plan, so they see no problem. So is the problem you wanna identify that they're not aware of the risk factors for special needs students at mealtimes? Uh, take the example where school administrators don't know what swallowing and feeding disorders are and therefore really don't see a problem. Uh, they don't know what can be done or that anything can be done. So is the problem a lack of education for administrators? Try to zero on on what the specific problem in your situation is. And so <clears throat> I would challenge you right now to write that down if you can think of it. Now, I'm the way to do this is through a committee. So you can come up with a lot of different ideas and really get to the core of the problem. By working together, a lot of people thinking, a lot of people coming up with ideas, that's where you're going to get a lot of creative uh, definitions of the problem, as well as causes of the problem, and then uh, ultimately solutions, which is the next step. You want to create possible solutions. This was the first time that I ever really, truly participated in a brainstorming uh, session. So you want the committee to brainstorm all the possible solutions to the problem that you have identified. And they can even be off the wall, bizarre solutions. For instance, you might say, well, I think that the district should hire five new OTs. We know that's not going to happen, but you can, you can say it. If that's what you think needs to happen, if, you, if that's what you think is a solution, no one judges no one evaluates. At this point, you don't evaluate or judge the solutions. You just write them down and move forward. And you do want to be creative. So the problem that I just talked about was that administrators are not aware of the risk factors for special needs students. So can someone contribute a solution that just in a brainstorming manner comes to their mind right now. You can unmute yourself or you can write it in the chat um, just to kind of get those juices flowing a little bit. What, what would be a solution to that problem? I would say just holding a meeting and maybe bringing a couple of colleagues along maybe an SLP, a school nurse, an OT, to kind of outline that problem um, with leadership. Mm -hmm. Okay, that sounds good. I'm not able to see. I don't know how I set wrong. Um, 
Okay, a anyone else want to offer a solution to this problem? Did you say that you're not able to see the chat, yeah, I can't Emily? See this I can't well, see there wasn't anything, but now there is. Uh, Lindsay is saying that having a PD talk with the staff, uh, perhaps collaborating uh, with the other team members, OTPT, et cetera, and right. personal development also. Yeah. Perfect. Good job. Have admin come to lunchtime to see the students. Oh my gosh. Kendra I, is giving us a reality check. I love that idea. Provide education, have a meeting and handout for admin to follow. Thank you, Devin. Sarah says in years past, they had to bring, uh, they had to bring in the union uh, into the conversation. Uh, sometimes you have to bring in bigger guns. I don't, I hope that didn't sound wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mean guns. I know oh, you know remember, that. Remember, <laughs> Deborah, at this stage, we don't evaluate. <laughs> okay, yes, that's okay. All right. Anything is, is acceptable. Okay, cool. Point. <laughs> and that's the fun part and really the very creative part of this process that we're talking about today. Well, and Kendra says she's a union VP and she agrees. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> I'll tell you, those were wonderful solutions. And my idea was to type them as you all said them. I realized now I never could have typed that fast. And I don't think I can type when it's on presentation mode. But those are wonderful solutions. Just in how many minutes did that take you guys to come up with some really nice solutions to that? Um, so and I could I am happy to share I mean we have the recording to the administrator I session agree. that we did agree. the first one and we kind of pared it down a little bit to some key resources because so I could share that um, just another thought excellent okay so then you go to step three you've got all these solutions now you have to evaluate and test the various solutions and you want to go through review the alternatives discuss their merits and disadvantages what we did is that we assigned we came up with maybe 30 you can see how quickly you're going to get solutions we came up with maybe 25 or 30 solutions and each person was given five to kind of live with for a week until we met again. And so you go over your solutions and you think about them at different times during your day and you may put a note that this one just wouldn't work and or this one seems like a really good idea or I thought maybe if we did this. So you're going to kind of review and go through what are the advantages or disadvantages of each of your solutions. And then you're, when the committee gets together, you're going to reject and eliminate some of the solutions because some of them just aren't going to work or they're not as good as the other solutions that have come up. And then you want to keep the ones you find most promising. Step four is that the committee decides on the solution they're going to use. So that's where you really have discussions. You um, try to reach a consensus of what would be the best route to take in trying to solve this problem. And so together as a committee, you come up with a solution and, and then you start thinking about what is the route you're gonna take to uh, implement it, to do it. And you wanna, provide everything along the way in writing so that everyone has all the information all the time. Step five, you want to implement that solution. So immediately after the solution has been generated, you, and it's been agreed upon, you want to talk about it. Who, what needs to be done exactly? Let's break it up into steps. Who's going to do what? Who's going to be responsible for what? And what is our timeline for doing it? So, you know, Again, you assign roles to each committee member of, okay, well, if you could put together this and you could do this and you could check with this person, and then when we come together, we'll have a complete package there. So put the plan in writing with the information on who's responsible for what. And then step six, once you've implemented the solution, you wanna look back and evaluate how the implementation is going. So once you get into it, you might say, wait, I don't think this is gonna accomplish our goal. We might need to go back and pick a different solution, or we may need to expand it or, or maybe revisit all the solutions. So an example of uh, would be the committee decides to prepare, like you say, someone suggested, an informational PowerPoint to present to the special education supervisors that includes the information that administrators need to know about swallowing and feeding in the schools. 
then the committee works with the supervisor of special ed to set up a time for that. So who are the administrators you want to invite? Certainly the uh, director of special ed and food service programs. You may have coordinators of related services. Um, you may even have an assistant superintendent who might want to uh, attend. Uh, and so then the committee members present the information, including what can be done. So you're going to identify what is the problem to them. You're going to tell them exactly what it is, who are the students. And as you go through preparing this, we've talked about this through the year. We've identified, you know, what is a swine and feeding disorder? What are the risk factors? Who are the people most at risk? Um, you know, and then you want to finish with here's what we can do. And we've talked about that as well. We've got a set procedure, we've got the forms, we know the personnel, we know the roles and responsibilities. So you let the administrators know. So that's how the problem solving process can be used with swallowing and feeding. And I think it's very powerful. So uh, at one of our presentations, we talked about leadership. And we're not going to talk about that today. But certainly, someone needs to take the leadership with the problem solving uh, process and forming the committee. And so consider that as well. So now let's talk about the most commonly identified barriers and challenges uh, and what you can do about them. Um, the first one that I want to address is lack of time. And of course, this is very timely to be talking about this because you're at the end of the school year, you've got a lot of IEPs to do, you're doing ESY information. I remember the, the end of the school year, the May being really chaotic. <laughs> um, so why do therapists have such a lack of time? Well, first of all, before you even begin addressing swallowing and feeding, you already have a full workload. It's not like you had this space that you can dedicate to something brand new. Your workload was pretty full. There's also shortage of personnel or positions. You may have the personnel, but they won't give you more positions that you need. So this really scrunches the ones that are hired to do more and more. And then we know swallowing and feeding is time intensive, particularly at the beginning. And we know that the things that make it an addition to your current workload are the interaction you're gonna to have to have with families, I mean, this is so important because you're talking about feeding their child. It's not something you can rush to through. Uh, conducting the interdisciplinary observation takes time and coordination and planning. Writing the plan and training the classroom staff is so important. Again, it takes tons of time. Who wants to hold another IEP? Nobody. If you, nobody wants to hold an IEP, they don't have to. This is one you have to hold, and it's in addition to the IEP you already probably did at the beginning of the year. Um, and then all of the other things we've talked about that in the process, the referral to instrumental, working with cafeteria people, setting up your monitoring schedule, and providing therapy. So let's talk about things that help. First of all, and I know I sound like a broken record, and I will today as well, <laughs> uh, a team approach. Not only is a team approach the best practice way to do it, um, but it helps to save time. Utilizing a team approach distributes the responsibility so that each team member doesn't have to, do, so that one team member isn't doing everything. Think about the professionals in your current situation that you would like to approach about being on the team. What are the ways that working together could make your caseload more manageable? In my brainstorming process, um, I felt that working as a team, because of the shared responsibility from monitoring a student's plan and solving problems, answering questions, if you uh, aren't having to seek out the answer, it certainly saves time. So having more qualified people available uh, to answer questions and problem solve will help save time. Uh, and it's not wasted on the uncertainty of who's responsible for what. You know, by doing our role and responsibilities and that training, everyone knows their role, so you're not wasting time. And I know that sounds little, but that can be huge because if the teacher knows what she's supposed to be doing and she's doing it, 
you don't have to worry about that, okay? Um, if you know that the physical therapist is going to be looking out for that back brace and for the positioning and all the things that are necessary for that child to be in the position to eat safely, it's something that the OT and the speech and the nurse do not have to worry about. And then there's shared decision-making, which means that um, we just use the expertise we have and then let the other people use their expertise as well. And so that will save time. Another thing that helps, believe it or not, as hard as it is to have another IEP meeting, another thing that helps is to um, have an IEP. And that's because at that time, everyone gets on the same page, uh, including the parents, and they know what the plan is. So they sign releases, that saves a lot of time. We can talk about the swallow study if we need one uh, and discuss the child's plan. Um, so the, the IEP, you get so much done at one point that uh, it really does help. Uh, the procedure, having a procedure takes away the uncertainty of what am I going to do? When, to, when should I do it? Who does what? There's consistency throughout the district and the forms allow you to just automatically document as you go through it. Another this thing. recording of those uh, procedures is probably a good idea too. We've probably talked about that, but showing the procedure in action to help people uh, with clarity might help too, I'm thinking. Yeah, I think so. Does anyone else have any ideas they want to talk about? Or anything in the chat room? Not seeing anything yet. Okay. You're, well, you're doing great, giving us lots of food for thought. <laughs> feel free if you think of something as I'm talking, um, to put it in the chat and Deborah will uh, talk, she'll, she'll present it. Uh, so in speech, we talk about alternative service delivery. I'm not really sure where this fits into our occupational therapy schedules. I know you guys do a lot of consultation, um, but for speech, we found that if we uh, do different times and different number of days, uh, we all we used to be stuck in 30 minutes twice a week, and now we're just much more flexible that way. We find that actually children make more progress, and it is time saving. We, they came up years ago with a five minute articulation session, and what this means is that the speech therapist goes to right outside the classroom, pulls a child, does intense therapy for five minutes one on one. Uh, there are no games, there's no rewards, there's no uh, coloring or anything like that. The only reward the child gets is that they get to see what progress they made during the session. So progress becomes the reward. So my thought and the way I think is, hmm, could this work for OT? I don't mean the articulation part, but could the model of an intense, very short session work in part of your management technique? Um, are there things that you can do with your children in five minutes to really move them forward? Say, if for speech, sometimes we do three times a week, five minutes, two times a week, five times a week, just depends on the severity of this uh, child's disorder and what the child needs. If you think you're kind of open to something or learning more about that, here are some articles um, that uh, are about the articulation in particular, but remember we can always think out of the box. We can always say, well, yeah, that's a structure that I think I could adapt to what I do. Larissa, I see that you unmuted yourself. Is that because you wanted to share something? Oh, she just, I think she might be just be joining us. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, sorry, thank you. Uh, Hi, Larissa, welcome. <laughs> Okay, so it's my understanding that uh, OTs do a lot of consultation services, and I am a big believer in consultation services. Um, I think we can get an awful lot accomplished uh, through what we do with monitoring uh, students of safe eating, talking to teachers and paras, observing the child eating, discussing the student's plan with team members, training the classroom staff and working with parents about implementing a plan at home or oral motor program at home. These are all consultation services that when uh, used correctly can really be effective as I know you guys already know. Um, so 
my thoughts about consultation as a therapy model is that it is an active therapy model and that it can be very effective. The goal for consultation is written in the same, in my eyes, and you tell me if I'm wrong for you guys, it's written the same as any other goal. What do you want the child to accomplish? It always begins with the student will. So for example, the student will improve lateral tongue movement for chewing by doing the fo following oral motor exercises three times a day for five minutes per day. On the therapy log, you put train classroom staff to implement oral motor exercises prior to lunch and snack. Staff performs the exercises as directed. Um, and then you, you have, the staff has a data form and you're able to record the progress as they go along. To me, this can be even more effective sometimes than the one-on-one -on -one is. Another thing that is extremely effective in saving time and helping us to uh, make the most of the time we have is a well-trained classroom staff. Once this eating plan is established, you really wanna make sure that the designated feeders know the plan, they know how to feed the child, and that you trust that they're doing it correctly. Um, you also want them to learn the signs that indicate that a child's plan may no longer be appropriate or that something's changing. A well-staffed classroom staff are the eyes and ears for the professionals who set up the plan. And I tell people when we talk about the monitoring schedule, which we did a while ago, um, if you have a really good, well-trained classroom staff and you have observed them feeding the child and you're very, very comfortable, you maybe don't need to do monitoring as often as you would with a train a staff that isn't trained well and that isn't following the thing. So it actually can be a big time saver for the therapist. So this is Katie, one of our thera speech therapists uh, and you have a minute to listen. Hi, my name is Katie Miranda. I previously worked as an itinerant speech pathologist within my public school district. And then I went and worked in an outpatient adult rehab hospital setting. Um, but now I'm back in the school system I work full time at one elementary school. I currently have 35 students on my caseload, ranging from pre K to sixth grade. And I have 13 of those students have dysphagia concerns. Um, as far as my school, it's very unique in that we uh, offer classes to serve students with a variety of diagnoses, such as cerebral palsy, uh, trisomy 17, Down syndrome, um, and so on. So a lot of times my students not only have communication, I mean, dysphagia goals, but they'll also have communication goals as well. Um, as far as scheduling, uh, a majority of my students are seen multiple times a week. So I will make a plan on my schedule to go at least one time a week within the cafeteria or within their classroom um, to treat dysphagia and work on the dysphagia goals. Um, as far as dysphagia goals, uh, my students may have oral and pharyngeal dysphagia goals, or they may have behavioral feeding goals, uh, such as picky eating, um, food aversions, and overstuffing. Um, when I do go in the classroom uh, or the cafeteria, the one time per week, um, I will either observe them feeding, uh, the paras and um, classroom staff feeding them, um, or I will work directly with them to show them some strategies that they can use. Um, my biggest thing that I like to do is have the classroom staff, teacher, or parent sit with me um, during each session uh, so that I can kind of gauge what's going on when I'm not in the classroom, but also to show them some specific strategies uh, that they can use. Um, having the para or the teacher with me during my session is a huge benefit to my schedule because it's during my dedicated speech time that I can sit with them and consult and I don't have to go find them later on. Um, my biggest recommendations probably uh, for scheduling um, is to make sure that you have a really well-trained and well-educated staff. In the beginning of the school year, it's super important to develop, create a really good plan have um, everyone be trained on the plan, sign off on the plan, and in the beginning of the school year or when a student first transfers, make sure you're really addressing dysphagia.
to where by the end of the school year, um, the classroom staff will need less and less help and assistance uh, from you um, as the speech pathologist. I also recommend um, always consulting your physical therapist, occupational therapist, and nurse um, on campus because they have might have some other recommendations. Um, and especially if you have students with dysphagia or uh, medical concerns, things can change. Um, I also recommend that you know your staff come to you with any questions. Uh, and that you always have an open dialogue with them and that um, talk to them on a daily basis. Okay, so um, the things that Katie said that I thought were important, first I have to explain, that is a very low caseload and I do recognize that. She was- one That was of exploding in the chat. Everybody was oh, jealous. Yes. How I know. does that and happen? I'll tell you how it happened here. First of all, um, you know, we were able to get positions when asked for them by, uh, pulling in the Medicaid money and things of that sort and outlining the need. But uh, in her case, that school had a very high, pretty significant uh, disability population and she saw all of them. So her caseload wasn't balanced at all. You know, the other therapists would see all the cases that were, I, I, for lack of a better word, easier maybe, less intense, you know, so because she was working on, um, you know, with those kids, with those kids didn't just have dysphagia, they had uh, assistive technology they needed, they were some were hearing impaired, they had um, multiple uh, orthopedic disabilities. So it, it was more time consuming. And we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. That's another way of making time. Um, so were there any comments about that that I need to address that I haven't said yet, Deborah? I don't see any comments uh, at this point. Mary Ellen, I see that you've unmuted a couple of times. Did you have something that you wanted to share or? No, sorry about that. <laughs> oh, okay. Just making sure I'm acknowledging it. Anyone so, feel free to raise your hand too, if you definitely want to get attention. <laughs> so I, I want to say that um, what, what Katie said about training the classroom staff is so important for, as a time saver. But also, as you are there and you're doing this year after year after year, that too starts getting better because not only was your classroom staff trained last year, there's trained again this year, they really begin to understand what's going on. And so, you know, just by doing the procedure each year, things start getting easier and uh, to, to manage. Okay, so what we did with Katie was a weighted workload. Okay, so the caseloads were weighted so that the therapist that um, had the milder cases, she had probably 50 kids or more, but Katie only had 36 because she had the more intense ones. Um, these are some articles on that strategy. Again, I apologize to OT. My, the articles I have really are, um, most of them uh, geared towards speech therapy. Um, and I don't know if you can go to this link and maybe be able to access it. You might have to get a speech pathologist with you to pull it up and get permission to go in. I see we had a raised hand, Deborah. We do. And it's Vicki Bernard. Vicki, come on down. Vicki. So when you're talking about year after year, it gets easier with the staff. What I have found Yes, it does get easier, but in some cases, what I have found is for staff that have been around for a long time, it's like, oh, I don't need to go through this training. I already know it all. Mm -hmm. And and they're the ones that I see when I go in that are making the biggest mistakes at times. Not all of them, but some of them. And so it kind of gets lackadaisical you know, almost yeah well you know and and we had that problem you also could have that problem when you're first starting because they're used to be doing they're used to doing whatever they want to do to feed the child and they really get close to these kids and they feel like they know 
the right thing. Um, but uh, we, it got to the point where we really needed to put that thing at the bottom where they sign and say they've been trained on the, on the plan. And that was because of what you're talking about, that, you know, they were kind of, oh, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, I know what to do. I can do it. And they'd show us. But then they'd go and do their own thing and say, well, you didn't really train me or anything. So we, we now make them verify that training. And that is why we have to do the ongoing monitoring, because we have to make sure that they're not falling back into that decision making, which they are not qualified. So the only thing I can say about that, if you have someone who is really abusing that and to the point where you're concerned about the safety of the child, you know, I would definitely, I always say talk to the classroom teacher because the classroom teacher is responsible for the paraprofessional. But then you also might want to put them through some kind of training on the risks and what can happen. You know, there's plenty of cases on Google where children have um, choked to death you know, because they weren't being fed correctly. So you might have to put a little scare into them by giving them more knowledge, you know, so uh, that's what I would recommend. Um, and then the ongoing conversation right now about turnover, and you think you got somebody trained and it turns over. And so Bonnie uh, mentioned the same thing. Do you have any strategies when there's that constant turnover? Uh, yeah, you know, uh, one of the things that I am recommending now that I wasn't before, and I guess, you know, this whole Zoom thing has <laughs> exploded. I think you can do a nice procedural training um, video for new hires, that they learn all those things I've talked about. What is the swallowing feeding? What are the risk factors? What, uh, how do you work as a team? What are the role responsibilities? What is the procedure? Now, when you're doing it for classroom staff, the procedure is just a listing mainly, a brief explanation. They don't need the detail that you guys need as to what each step means, but you could put together a um, presentation that would be part of their new hire uh, training. And then you would have to do the specific child training, but it would take care of that one piece that you could use with classroom teachers, you could use it with paraprofessionals, you could use it with principals, uh, with anyone other than the core team members who would need a more detailed training. Okay, so the weighted workload, that worked very well for us. There's also what they call a 3-1 model where you work uh, three weeks doing direct services and one week is designed for indirect services, um, uh, paperwork, meetings, things of that sort. And then there's the 4-1 model, which is similar, except that you spend four days a week doing your direct, your therapy services and one day a week is set around, set aside for consultation, IEPs, evaluations, things of that sort. And there is an article on that. Now, in my district, we did the 4-1. We did four days of direct therapy, uh, including in-class sessions, pull-out sessions, five-minute sessions, so on. And then the fifth day was reserved for testing, report writing, consultation, makeup sessions. Medicaid billing and so on. And so, you know, it, it gave them permission and time to do their workload duties that other than therapy. So um, this may not work for, um, for you, but it might. And you, so think about your caseload and what it looks like. And is there a kind of different approach to it that you maybe haven't done before and try it. Diversified roles, and that's where there's two or more SLPs or OTs or nurses at school. Again, that's kind of like the weighted caseload, actually. But we, what, what this one is, is that someone you know really enjoys working with the autistic population, so they will take those kids as well as some of the more typical kids. And then someone else really likes assistive technology and dysphagia, so they will take those kids. So you can see about dividing caseloads up to kind of meet not only interest, but intensity of services. There's a comment from Larissa. She's, uh, feel free to unmute and share, but she says she's found that attending assistant monthly staff meetings is a good touch point on all the SLP topics uh, to maintain the relationship, plan for the next training, et cetera, uh, mm -hmm. quest answering questions and directing the service time at the 
uh, same time as the staff who feed. Wonderful. That sounds really good. Now, tell me, what was that called again? She attends what? Um, often there's um, a monthly meeting. We call them uh, instructional assistants. I don't know, eight, all the things people call this extra support yeah. staff that's okay, often with, mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the learning specialists or whoever their support people are. And if I make a point of attending that meeting, it's helpful. Now, um, is that a per child or is that per class? No, so that would be a group that that would just be these are the people on staff at our school. And and oh, they that's wonderful. So you can really learn from them, but you can also contribute. That's yeah, and, and it's just helpful as an SLP. You're often not there the day that somebody has a question. Mm -hmm. And so it's and it doesn't mean you wouldn't follow a student with a feeding need more carefully or an AAC, but just in general, um, that's a a good place to keep your finger on if there's yeah, been a problem and, or something. And I think that what you're, you know, what you're talking about here is kind of, uh, and sometimes I think as SLPs and OTs, we kind of need to shift our way of thinking of what's valuable in what we do. And we want to make sure that what we're doing is making a difference. And a meeting like that could make a bigger difference in some cases than other services you might be doing. So I think it's real important that we really step back and look at what we're doing, what's yielding results, and and uh, what is worth the time to do it. So, and, and we've been talking about in our bigger conversations about uh, empowering uh, uh, it, classroom assistants and paras on all levels in SPED. They'd come in not knowing what it looks like, but feeding is mm -hmm. certainly one of those components that should be considered. There'll be a bigger project on that. Watch for details. <laughs> okay, so other things you can do is restructure your caseload, setting priorities, investigate Medicaid funds. Um, for, for my district, I was the Medicaid person. I'm not sure how that happened. It happened years ago, but and it was a hard job. But in the long run, it put me in the position to know, number one, how much money our related service people were bringing in, which was a good chunk of change. And that gave me then the leverage to talk to uh, supervisors about the need for additional personnel, not only for things like swallowing and assistive technology, hearing impairment, things of that sort, but for the paperwork that's involved in claiming Medicaid. You know, So finding that person who can advocate for those Medicaid funds in one year, we got enough Medicaid funds, I would say, to fund three positions. And that, and that may not sound like a lot, but when you add all the benefits that we get in the schools, the numbers go pretty high. So three positions uh, in one year. So every, three, every year you could get you know, an additional position maybe. So it's something to think about and look at your situation and see if that's a possibility. Um, you also wanna to try to work with administrators and uh, go through that problem solving process and offer their solutions. Um, use you know the training of the staff we've already talked about, being very proficient with the procedure, knowing it and being able to make it flow will help. And of course, always the roles and responsibilities. Any more comments about the time factor? I spent a lot of time on that, but I think it's important. Um, I'm not seeing anything in the chat. Okay. The next most, one of, one of the other most common ones I get is the knowledge and skills. There's a lot of uncertainty about treating dysphagia in particular in the schools because of the medical side of it. And of course, in the hospitals, it's such a, uh, a big part of what SLPs and OTs do. And it's also a very risky part. Um, so in the schools, it's a little different because um, our children are not sick, they're healthy. In most part, we do have some sick children, but for the most part, the children we followed on the swallowing and feeding team were healthy. They had what we would call a chronic swallowing and feeding disorder, not an acute, okay? So I, the focus is a little different than the hospital setting. And so it's something that, yes, you do need specific knowledge and skills, 
but you want to know what are the things I need to know. So identify what skills you need to be able to competently follow it in the schools. So you don't need to know how to conduct a uh, modified bear and swallow. And you need to know how to read the report and observe it, you know, watch it and know what you're seeing. But as far as being responsible for it, you don't. Um, talk to the administrators and to RSOI, Deborah, about providing courses you need to obtain your skills. So if you feel like you need more skills in the evaluation, assessment of swine and feeding disorder part, let her know. And she can and, you know, make sure she finds someone who can provide that information to you. If you really need more information on treatment and therapy, that's another area, okay? And then seek out other professionals who may have the skills that you don't. There may be someone, <coughs> excuse me, on your campus or in your um, group that really has some great skills with swallowing and feeding and can share and mentor. And uh, so that's my next thing, mentoring. We did find that that was extremely effective for uh, therapists to have someone they could ask questions, someone that they could watch do something um, and that could guide them through the process. But this will take that administrative support that we've talked about in the past because you need that mentor will need time. They will need maybe two half days a week to help other people, okay? But by use, using someone like that to mentor others, everyone starts building skills and you start building capacity. One thing that I found really helpful was to order a textbook. Um, these are the two, two most recent ones that I've gotten. And uh, I, I use them all the time when I have a question about something. Now they are geared primarily towards adults, although um, this one by Suter and Gosa are across the age span. Um, but I, I do find that I get some very quick, good information. I know we can Google everything, but I know that this has been peer reviewed. I know that this information is correct. So I, I highly recommend either having your district order the textbooks or uh, if, if you're seeing a lot of children and you feel a need to get it yourself. So what we did in my district to kind of improve um, our knowledge and skills is we paired with Southeastern Louisiana University, which is only about 30 miles away from uh, where I live. And they provided, a, they came to our school district and provided a graduate level course on dysphagia. And I think about 15 of our therapists attended that. Then we also provided annual training. Initially, I would say for the per first probably five to 10 years, we did six hours of training on the procedure and dysphagia for the OTs and the speech. And occasionally nurses would come, but mostly it was OT and speech um, per year. Okay, and then, then it dropped to three hours because it was getting to be too much. And plus people had already built their knowledge and we were getting new grads in. We were hiring people who had the coursework and everything. So we didn't need the six hours, but initially you may need that. Again, you need your administrative staff on board in order to provide that kind of training to give people time during the uh, school year to attend these uh, presentations. And then pro we provided a consultant, kind of like a mentor that would assist the therapist and helps to kind of train them and get them ready to work independently. Any of you have concerns about liability? That seems to be uh, something that comes up almost all the time when I talk to groups of people. Our attorney said the keys to minimizing liability exposure are planning, procedures, training, and the proper execution of those procedures, and of course, documentation. So this brings me to a Galton board, and I don't know if you're familiar with the Galton board, but it is a probability machine. So it is a mathematical uh, construct. It brings to life the statistical concept of normal distribution, okay? So keep that in mind as we watch this. Professor Terence Tao is the equivalent of a rock star in mathematics. Regarded as the greatest math.
Okay, I'm going to stop it right here and tell you what you're seeing. What you're seeing is that they poured, I believe the number is 6,000 balls through these, this pegboard. The pegboard is all spaced the same and are able to determine the probability of where things will fall. And as you're beginning to see, it starts to form a bell-shaped curve. And that probability is for almost anything that you want to know, okay? So um, the probability, uh, they use this with gambling, they use it you know, for a number of things. But as you look at this, and it's not completely done yet, but see on the far edges to the left and to the right, how few of the balls fell over there. So where this applies to what we're talking about today is that these at the far end are the difficult parents, the difficult cases where parents threaten due process or, or very unhappy and go to the superintendent. As you can see, the large majority of the students that you work with and you help, they fall in this, uh, in this middle bell shape. So what we've been talking about this year, all of our courses that we've been doing this year, what they do is that they fill in some of these spaces and cut down the, the risk of the students on the far side. Um, so the things that we've talked about, and we'll talk about it a little more, because I say it over and over, you fill in these gaps and you lower the probability of the risk of due process. So the things that lower that probability, the gaps that we fill in is following the USDA regulatory regulations, making sure that the cafeteria staff knows how to properly prepare the food, and that they provide nutritious foods according to the safe eating plan. That our professionals follow their code of ethics. You know, if you're following your code of ethics, you're, you have a much less chance of being sued for, for anything and been found guilty anyway. Uh, includes ethics and com competency in your area of practice. So increase your knowledge. Do, do the things you need to do to be more competent, to work with the students we see. Remember, there, a lot of them are oral phase dysphagia. A lot of them are chronic and you know, something that will be managed throughout their year, their, throughout their lifetime. Um, so <clears throat> work within the setting that you're working. Um, use the district supported procedure. It provides consistency, that lowers your risk, okay? It provides accountability. Um, so everyone knows what they're supposed to do. That lowers the risk. Documentation always lowers the risk. And you're looking at safety. If you can show that you were looking at safety, you're in a much better position. <clears throat> so consistency, we're using it with any school within the district. Accountability, procedures are written, roles and responsibilities and training is done. Everyone is accountable. There is a clarification of those roles, so we know where any link is that if it falls apart, and that we're providing what IDA says we have to do, which is for the safety of children at school. Okay, um, and then documentation. And you I know. do have a couple of questions okay. uh, in the Let's, chat, a couple of comments. Okay. Uh, Larissa said, uh, "Is it expected that cafeteria provide and prepare?" food. I think we've talked about that. We can touch on it again. Is it the SOP and OT who, perf uh, who prep and uh, looking at what the regulations are in Oregon? So is it typically, who okay, typically prepares? Are, 
Yeah, those are great questions. Um, first of all, I want to tell you that this is a federal program. So it is not an Oregon thing. It is um, the, the regulations are federal and every state must follow them. And what the regulations say is that if a child with dis disabilities needs the modification of the school cafeteria um, <clears throat> food, then the, the cafeteria program must provide those modifications, even if it results in a uh, cost to them in equipment or personnel. So no, the SLP and OT should not be preparing the texture of the food. Um, it is the responsibility of the cafeteria. I think you might want to be involved in initially training them and making sure that they use the IDSI model and that they understand what your recommendations call for. They must get what they call a prescription for meal modification. Anytime the school lunch is um, modified, they must get this signed by a physician or, and if you read the regulations, or they can put it on the IEP, the um, school team can put it on the IEP, what the disorder is, why that child needs a modified diet, and what are the types of modifications that are needed, and share that with your cafeteria staff, which will would take the place of the physician form. So the purpose of that is so that the school lunch program maintains the nutrition that the child needs, even though they're modifying the food. So that's one of the reasons they need to do that. And then the other is for funding purposes. If you have more questions about that, just shoot me an email and I will send you a copy of the regulations so that you can present it to your supervisor of food, uh, uh, food services program. The, the, the problem is we started initially having our par training the parents to prepare the textures and all, but they shouldn't even be in the cafeteria. I mean, they, so it is a cafeteria responsibility. So as you're getting started, it's important to work with that supervisor of uh, food services and get that going. And they can be trained on the ITSI just like you and I can be. So, uh, and for those who don't know, the ITSI is the International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative. It is where it is going. They're no longer using the National Dysphagia Diet. They're phasing that out. So since you're getting started, be better to start with ITSI. Any comments or questions on that? Well, uh, Sarah says that in her large district that it's more efficient to have the classroom staff modify. So for efficiency, uh, that I mean, that may be an option. Um, mm -hmm. And then Lynn tells us that there are specific documents, nutritional medical statements that family and or provider can complete and return to the school. Right. And that's the form I was talking about. Right. They must get that for every student, but the IEP and the general student information can also be substituted. And a lot of districts don't realize that. They still go for the physician's signature, and it's really not required if the child is a special need child and has an IEP that has those statements. Okay, well then uh, Lynn had another comment. She said and, uh, one of the most beneficial steps that they took was to meet with the SLPs and providers who participate in the studies and ask them to include a note in the report indicating that the findings don't necessarily transfer to other settings like home versus school. Mm, okay, yeah, yeah, uh, that, that's a good point. We, we do sometimes recommend diets that are different from what the child is eating at home. So that would be helpful for sure. And then um, Melanie says, is there anyone who's been successful in, achieve in achieving this level of uh, support with their food service? She wants to connect. Maybe we should connect them all. Is there a meeting that they all go to that we can somehow present at? Is there a cafeteria workers orientation at the beginning of the year? Hmm. How can we come in and mass force here? Deborah, you're good at this brainstorming stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to jump in real quick. Deborah, we have in Salem Kaiser, we have a nutritionist who works specifically through the food services. So that is our point of contact. So they are the ones that would get these nutritional medical statements. Then they're forwarded to the cafeteria if we have any specific di dietary needs. Most of the students that need modifications are in our self-contained classrooms. So the OTs are the ones in our setting that would go in and do the training, and developing the feeding protocol and train the staff on food uh, consistency and liquid. 
Excellent. Uh, it, I'm hearing, I'm seeing lots of great yay for you. Uh, good, <laughs> good, good suggestions. And Stacy saying that she likes, uh, and you can unmute Stacy. I don't have to read this verbatim, but it says, I like that having dietary uh, needs documented in the FSP can obligate the cafeteria to provide those diets. Asking parents to schedule it, uh, yet another appointment is a burden. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I, my daughter is a speech pathologist in a hospital setting and um, I was talking to her and I asked her, you know, uh, do you have to train the cafeteria to do the texture you want? And she says, no, they're, they're responsible. They have to know this. And I, I started thinking, well, what about schools? And then I found these regulations that really say they are responsible. Now I totally get what you said, uh, what someone said just a few minutes ago, um, that the OT trains the classroom staff and the classroom staff does it. That is a very efficient way to do it. I think my school district, we started off with the SLPs training the um, classroom staff and modifying the food in the cafeteria, which they let us, which I've come to find out, you're really probably not supposed to do that. But um, I think they're still doing it that way because they know it, they've been doing it, it's easier. But if you're just starting out, you really need to work with that food service program. And they're the ongoing program. That's, uh, the, our, that's, the, uh, that's the big picture, you know, looking 10 years down the line, looking that we want that cafeteria to know the textures and to be able to provide it for our kids so that the OT doesn't have to train them. I mean, that's time. We just talked about time. And that's time. And it that's a lot of time because you want to make sure they get it right. You know, um, so when you look at the time, it makes sense to work with your cafeteria. Larissa says, uh, and when we look at who's a member of our feeding team, she says that in a previous school district, the food service director was part of the feeding team and the quarterly wish meetings. I like that idea oh, too. I love quarterly, that idea. quarterly wish, wish meetings. Meeting. Yes. Excellent. Do you have anything oh. to add to that, Larissa, about the effectiveness or how you got them at those tables? Well, wish is a mistake for ish, but if wish works just fine. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, I say wish no, meetings. No, no. No, oh, okay. No, we, we like the wish meeting. I think yeah. I'm going to adopt it if you don't mind. Um, Go ahead. No, no, it was just part of, uh, you know, administratively from the top down these are the people who needed to be so we had um ot and pt and a couple representative slps and nursing and the food service director was just a part of the district feeding team and, um, and they we, should be they should be um, this is a goal mark that on our goal list yeah, they should be mm -hmm. and kyla has her hand up kyla would you like to unmute um, yes one of my one of the things i just wanted to say is just in because we um in ours, the OTs or the SLPs, like we're on our team, we'll do the, the training and we do the assessments together collaborative, collaboratively for all of that. But the one benefit of, so we train our staff to prep the food is just that a lot of our students um, have lots of different sensory sensitivities. And so they may only eat, you know, a certain type of food that like it might be blended to a certain, uh, have to be blended to, you know, to a certain level, which certainly the cafeteria staff could do that, but knowing, uh, you know, maybe they're only willing to eat, you know, uh, some type of puree with, you know, two cups of yogurt and, and we can blend chicken. And I mean, there's where so our, 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 Kayla, do you work with the cafeteria then to put the foods on their tray that, that you need, or do you just get a general tray and then bring in your own foods to, to make it specific to the sensory needs of that child? How do you do, how do you handle that? So most of the time, um, our staff will just get the, they, they go to the cafeteria and they pick out the food. And okay. it is something that we really work with our staff a lot on trying to build uh, their tolerance to different, because uh, there's different levels of texture, like within, you know, purees and stuff like that. And there's, and just different tastes, like maybe it has to have a little bit more. I have a, a student now that has to have at least one container of yogurt, you know, that sweetness, or she is just right. absolutely not going to eat it. And so I could see, uh, for those students, it would be very difficult um, to have the cafeteria staff 
be that attuned to what those students needs are and they're always our staff we really train them on trying to really build our students you know their willingness to try different foods uh, and so they they really keep up with oh hey this time they try it we're willing to try this type of food let's try to do that and add a little bit something more to it you know those kind of things that um I think it would be difficult if it were just the, the cafeteria doing that if if our staff don't have some control. I think there you know, might always be some children where it has to be specialized. For the greater part, in my district, we were following 200 students. The majority of those students really could be, it, the cafeteria could be doing it, I think. You know, there's probably a few that it wouldn't work for. Okay, so we're gonna move on. Um, we're talking about liability concerns. Um, of course, using evidence-based research to support your decision-making. And I put the evidence-based practice link for ASHA and AOTA for you to reference and to get articles uh, uh, that are evidence-based regarding swallowing and feeding. And of course, uh, your obligation to student safety. Um, the procedure, the essentials of the procedure, making sure that what you're doing has these things. Those are the things that fill in the spaces and, and really cut down the probability of a parent being unhappy, okay? Using a team approach does that as well. Um, so all of these things we've talked about, IDEA, legal mandates, USDA reg regulations, ethical responsibility, the procedure team approach, and working closely with the parents, all of these really do reduce your risk of, um, uh, okay, we're, we're almost out of time here. Um, in this case, uh, there was a parent that didn't agree with the recommended diet. As the coordinator of the swallowing and feeding program, I met with her, we talked about it and the team and came up with some compromises. So there's gonna be times that you really need to listen to the parents and um, talk them through and, and really listen to what they're saying because they do feed their child every day. And sometimes we may be a little bit overprotective and we may come to find out that what they're saying really does work. And then they're more likely to accept the things that we really can't bend on. Okay. So now I was gonna talk about administrators and how they can help to shape the pegboard as well. Um, why don't administrators support the swine and feeding team? Well, a lot of times it's a lack of information or understanding. They may not be aware of the regulations or of the legal cases that are going on, or they may have concerns about the cost. So I have listed the things that administrators really need to know. And I've said all these things before, and we're not gonna probably have time to go through all of them because we've had such great discussions today, um, but you know what they are, you know, description of swine and feeding, what the district can do, um, the obligation for safety for our children, the least dangerous assumption, educational relevance, you want to share with them the legal cases and mandates. There's a new one down here that was a Florida student, 19 years old with autism. He died at high, in, in his high school uh, because he wasn't being monitored. Um, he uh, was a choking risk, they knew that. And uh, unfortunately he didn't get the treatment he needed uh, through a procedure like we've been talking about. So sometimes informing administrators of some of these cases that they really may not be aware of um, because they have a lot on their plate, but this is what administrators are supposed to do. They're supposed to look at these things. They're supposed to listen to you. They have the power to make changes, okay? So you wanna share the federal regulations that we've talked about. You want to tell them, this is what you can do. These are the things you can do to make children safe at school, to protect children, and to reduce the risk of due process. We talked a little bit about the supervisor of food services. This is the regulation that I was talking to about. And like I said, if you would like the whole booklet, I can send that to you. Uh, I know many of you work in as contracts, so you may work with different districts. So you may have one that's great and another that doesn't want anything to do with it. So what we talked about preparing some kind of a video presentation, I think that could be a helpful thing for you. Um, you know, figure out if there's other people at the schools that aren't as supportive that maybe can help you move forward in that area and prepare a 
proposal and presentation that you can then use with all the districts that do not have it. Uh, we did that at the beginning. We formed a committee of OT, speech, and nurses, and we met with the top administrators. Um, we told them what swine and feeding disorders were and what the problems. Uh, we drafted some questions. I have included um, some of the responses, the questions and the responses that um, we we had um, at that time. Um, and so ensuring safe eating, it said it re relates to the duty of the school system to take reasonable steps. It talks about the code of ethics, parent refusal should be done on a case by case, but we have an obligation to respond to the interest of the child. All of these, this information can be helpful to give your administrator and then to go over, like uh, Deborah said, that first presentation we did of the things for administrator and perhaps ask your administrator to view it since it's a recorded uh, thing. Um, so at this point, we're about done. Um, what are you seeing as your, as your challenge? What, what do you see as your biggest challenge or barrier at this point? Anyone want to share that before we sign off? No? Did we solve all the problems? Let's work on world peace next. Emily. <laughs> Let's do it. Let's it do it. It only took seven sessions to get it all together. <laughs> Listen, you guys were great today. Uh, I love the interaction. I love the questions and the comments and the ideas you have. And so I hope that you'll be able to um, go back to your situation and use that problem solving method and think about uh, the things we've discussed today, the entropy, the the Galton board and how that all applies to what we're doing. And hopefully some of the challenges that you came in with may not seem as, um, uh, as big of obstacles as they were when you came in. Thank you all so much for making time to come today. And I look forward to seeing you in June when I assume you'll be very close to being finished. <laughs>